We hear it all the time that small business is the backbone of a healthy economy. From mom and pop operations to small, agile startups, in Ontario, small businesses employ about 28% of the working population. But as much as they play a big part, most never go beyond small. Is that for the best? Or are there things that inhibit their ability to scale up and grow into even bigger economic players? Joining us now on that, in our nation's capital, Craig Alexander, Senior Vice President, Chief Economist at the Conference Board of Canada. And here in our studio, Greg Sorbera, former Ontario Finance Minister, now Chancellor at York University. Catherine Swift, President of Working Canadians, a small business advocacy group. And we welcome back Anthony Lacavera, the CEO of Global Live, whose new book is called How We Can Win. Good to have you two with us here. And Craig, nice to have you on the line from the nation's capital. Let's set up our discussion by introducing these so-called small business facts. These are all taken from Anthony's book. And here we go. Small business contributes 30% of the GDP of this country. 70% of Canadians who work in the private sector, 70% are employed by small businesses. 98% of small businesses in the country have fewer than 100 employees. More than 75% have fewer than 10 employees. And more than half the businesses, half the small businesses in this country, have fewer than five employees. So we see the significance small business has to the country. Craig, I'll start with you. Are small businesses more important, in your view, to consumers than the big businesses we may be more familiar with? Well, I don't think small businesses get the attention they deserve. I mean, when Canadians think about businesses in Canada, they tend to think about the big brand names. But in point of fact, in terms of the number of institutions, as you said, you know, the bulk of the Canadian economy is actually small, small, small businesses. And those small businesses are, are plugged into, plugged into uh, the, larger, the larger business as well. They're, you know, they're often part of the supply chain, or alternatively, they may be providing services that are being bought by workers that work at large companies. Uh, and at the same time, what we see is that you know the bulk of job creation in Canada comes from startups, and startups tend to start off relatively small. So, you know, when it comes to job creation, we do pay a lot of attention to what's happening in in terms of the small business sector. I'd like to get Catherine Swift angry early. So, <laughs> I, I'm doesn't take much. Doesn't take much. <laughs> so I'm going to do that by quoting Andrew Coyne here. Okay, here's Andrew in the National Post last October. The federal liberals and their critics' rhetoric in praise of small business is remarkably similar. Backbone of the economy, cradle of capitalist dynamism, fount of growth, job creation and other good things. Surely it is self-evident that they should be rewarded with a lower rate of tax than other businesses. But in fact, the popular image of small business to which this appeals is mostly bogus, writes Brother Coyne. If anything, Canada suffers from having too many small businesses, which generally have much lower productivity than larger firms, Far from the growth-oriented dynamos of myth, most never grow beyond the tiny shop they started out as. Ms. Swift. Well, I, yeah. won't, I won't disagree 100% with Andrew on that, and he and I have debated this one too, by the way, in the past. Mm. Uh, that being said, um, for, for starters, I think we have to realize that in some industries and sectors, it's, that's not a bad thing. If you have you need your dry cleaner. That person is, does a good dry cleaning service, employs maybe two or three people, four, uh, pays their taxes, keeps people employed, contributes to their community, sponsors a local baseball team, and on and on. <laughs> so, but they're, no, they're not dynamic. Nope, and they're probably never gonna grow. Maybe they'll go and buy another dry cleaner. That's the extent of their, you know, their innovation. Mm -hmm. So, and, but there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, that being said, in the economy, you need a good mix, and you want the dynamic ones. So we were chatting offline about uh, BlackBerry and, and how we all miss our Blackberries <laughs> and things like that. Uh, but it, and that was a that was a small business that started with two people, and yet look what happened. Mm -hmm. Un unfortunately, it's although it's, it's re reinventing itself now, but you know it's had its uh, ebbs and flows. So I think we have to realize instead of dissing a certain group of small business that again, are doing a perfectly good job providing jobs for people and so on. Um, we also have to realize that's an important part of the economy, but we want the dynamic sector as well. And what can we do to promote that? And I think there's a very long list of what we can do. We shall get to that. I want to take Mr. Sorbera, though, back to a decade ago when he was Minister of Finance in Ontario and when people like Catherine Swift and others used to come to you and, you know, give the mythical speech about the importance of small business to the Ontario economy in hopes that you would change policy in its favor. Were you open to those kind of entreaties? Well, yeah, uh, we were then, and, and I would be now. The fact is that you can't separate, in an economy, an integrated economy like 
the Canadian or any modern capitalist economy. Uh, it's all interconnected. If, for example, uh, you are a large urban builder uh, in the city of Toronto or in any city in Canada, what you're really doing is uh, hiring on and bringing on the talents of dozens and dozens of small businesses, electricians, uh, bricklayers, uh, people who are pouring concrete. These are all, uh, under the definition, small businesses working all together. They create the product that the big business, the Mintos, the Tridels take credit for. Hmm. So it's all, one, it, it's all part of an integrated whole. You can't have big business without a vibrant, strong, uh, profitable small business sector. And small businesses will not grow, will not prosper, unless there are these large integrated organizations that bring all their talents but together. But Anthony, I wonder if you want to be a little bit critical of the fact that, as Catherine suggested, many small businesses are content to stay small. And they don't have bigger ambitions than that. Is yeah, that look, problematic for you? I think that Catherine hit it right on in terms of the need for a mix. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm highlighting that we're lacking in Canada, is just this ambition shortage generally. So when you compare our small business stats to productivity stats of comparably sized small business in the United States, those entrepreneurs, those business owners, are not just thinking about the local next dry cleaners to acquire. They're thinking about the next town over and how do I buy the four that are operating there. That's the mindset shift that I'm proposing we urgently need in Canada. Because we don't have it today. We just don't think that way today. There's nothing wrong with having the mix of uh, some businesses just have a limited, total, addressable market. In the yeah. example that Catherine raises, there's just no question they're that... They're very local. That's yeah. just, they're a local business. Yeah. They have a limited, total, addressable... That's, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. We need a lot more, though, of those businesses that are, to use your word, dynamic, that have an open-ended growth opportunity, an unlimited growth opportunity. I think Anthony underestimates the uh, quality of ambition in the Canadian economy. Uh, it may not be... Uh, uh, the quality of ambition in, say, the Russian economy, which is controlled by very ambitious, uh, very questionable personalities. But, I mean, if you look at, take, for example, the ambition of a Basili uh, in creating RIM. That was a, that, that, that was a great achievement. Uh, have a look at the ambition of the people who run Brookfield. Brookfield happens to be That's a great example. the largest real estate entity, asset management entity, in yeah. the world. Yeah. And it's rooted right here in Canada. Uh, look at Bombardier. It's... Oh, let's well, not, oh, let's not about look about at Bombardier. Tremendous <laughs> taxpayer support. <laughs> but, uh, but with respect, yeah. I mean, you yeah. called for government uh, promotion of, of these entities. Of and, winners. Uh, bon Picking winners. Bombardier oh, sells man. a lot of transportation vehicles mm -hmm. all over That's the world. Fair. Does it have problems? It sure does, but every business has problems. So uh, I, I think we underestimate ourselves when we say that this is an unambitious economy. No, I don't think we're saying that, though. I think we're saying we need more of that segment. Yes, they exist, but we need more of them. And, and certainly, you know, I can't stand hearing the Bombardier thing <laughs> simply because we've poured gorps of money into it. We just sold off a lot of it to an American company, oh, and, yeah. and, and that's Canadian taxpayer dollars. And, and that's why I disagree with government picking winners. I think they've got an abysmal history of it. Uh, and the, the main thing that works, to my way of thinking, if through decades of dealing with small business and so on, is competition. Well, and I go back to our trade agreements. Our yeah. trade agreements, you know, uh, they, the most, and there's a, there's a lot more answers than that, but if we want to be simplistic, my number one would be introduce more competition in that market. You would still have win mobile, if you ask me, yeah. if we didn't have restrictive rules that prevented for ownership reasons and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Uh, why do we have interprovincial trade barriers that make it easier to deal with a, another country than it does the province uh, next door? Talk about crazy it on the book stuff. Too. It's crazy insane. stuff let like me, that. Friends, let me jump in because uh, Craig uh, is in the nation's capital <laughs> patiently, <laughs> patiently waiting to get back into the this conversation, and I'm going to give him that entree to get back in right now. Craig, you know, there are politicians who talk a great game about small business, and you've heard all the cliches, backbone of the economy and so on. How small does a business have to be, in your view, from a public policy standpoint, to justify getting whatever tax advantages there are that governments may want to toss their way? Well, I, I, I think... I, it, the focus really should be on the, you know, is it really a question about championing small business or is it we should be championing bu businesses that have the potential to grow? Um, you know, I would pick up on the theme that the first interview talked about in terms of, you know, we need to have policy doubling down on businesses that are growing. 
right? So, you know, we shouldn't champion business just because they're small. The reason why we have preferential policies for small businesses is because, you know, they don't have the same access to capital as large businesses. Uh, they don't have the resources to deal with some of the regulatory requirements that, that large businesses have. Uh, and so as a consequence, you might want some preferences to help support small business. But at the end of the day, you need an economy that grows, that's going to create jobs, it's going to be vibrant. And it's really, you know, th this is a really critical juncture because right now we have an aging population and more of economic growth is going to come from productivity and innovation. That's where we're actually going to get the rise in standard of living of Canadians. And so that means we need more companies to grow. And so we shouldn't just look at sm small business and say, well, let's champion them because they're small. What we really need to do is, is to champion them so they can grow. And that means removing barriers to growth. Can I get you to weigh in and perhaps break the tie between Anthony and Greg here on whether or not there is a satisfactory amount of ambition among those who run small businesses to actually turn them into bigger businesses, as you've clearly said you, you hope happens? Well, I would say that, you know, there's, there's the issue of ambition. Uh, certainly from a cultural point of view, Canadians, you know, in some sense get get embarrassed if you become rich if you're if you're really successful then you know it, it, it you know they be start becoming very humble because you know that's not something you're supposed to crow about and i'm not sure that that's the right the right culture to create a, a, a vigorous business environment but the the flip side of ambition is risk aversion and there's been a number of studies done there was a really good one by deloitte that showed that canadian business owners are one third more risk averse than their u.s counterparts and so there's there's the there's the you know you we need businesses to strive for success we need them to 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 strive to win, but at the same time we also need them to be willing to take a bit more risk and and from a Canadian cultural point of view, that seems to be one of the impediments. Catherine, it almost seems as if staying small is rewarded, as opposed to risking more to grow. Is that fair to say? Um, well, I think I think there is some truth to it, uh, um, and and uh, Craig put his finger on the issue. People say, why is there a small business corporate income tax rate, for example? And let's not forget too, the only businesses that can take advantage of that is the ones that are making money. And at any given time, usually about half of the small business community is actually making money; half aren't. So you know, it's important to, again to know context here. Um, uh, but the, 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 reason, the, the original reasoning, and this goes back a long time, and all countries, by the way, have a version of this, so this is not a uniquely Canadian thing, but the notion of having a smaller rate is indeed to cope, as Craig mentioned, with there, there's a lot of research that shows the regulatory burden foisted on small business to be tax collectors, to remit payroll taxes, to deal with the red tape, to deal with the CRA, which our Auditor mm -hmm. General recently said 30% of the time gives you the wrong answer uh, to a tax question. Anyway, on and on and on. The reason... That, that, that's the reason for it. In a large firm, you, you have the economies the, of scale. If you've only got five people working for you, you need a break. Well, well you're, you're, you're struggling. And I'll tell you, when I've heard from small businesses, the number one thing they say is not taxes. It's the burden government puts on me. I am working at midnight to fill out that paper yeah, make sure for staff right. can or, you know, CRA, yeah. whatever yeah. it happens to be. That is the reason for it. And, well, and frankly, ask, that's justified. Let me that ask is the justified. I want to ask the former finance minister, does government put too many of these kinds of burdens on small business that prevents them from becoming bigger businesses? This is one of the occasions where uh, my dear friend Catherine Swift and I are in absolute <laughs> agreement. That's absolute scary. agreement. Scary. Uh, <laughs> it has nothing to do with the rate of tax. Uh, the rate of tax is the amount of the check that you will send in uh, at tax time. Uh, the big burden for small business is a regulatory burden, and it comes from uh, municipal governments, it comes from the provincial government, and it comes from the national government. And there has been very little real regulatory reform, uh, notwithstanding that virtually every government, when it tries to get elected, uh, promises to uh, clean up the regulatory mess. Uh, what happens is they get into power, we get into power, and we add to that regulatory burden. Although, and I'll give you a little, I'll, I'll tip my hat to you here a little bit, not that you need it, but you were part of a government that actually harmonized the sales taxes federally we did. and provincially, and, and, and made and things easier for small business. Income tax as well, uh, and, which and, is something that was a great, agree, but, agreed but, with. But, but, but that's a small amount of the regulatory burden. Yeah. There yes. are, uh, there's endless process that has to uh, be abided by. Uh, before actually being able to sell the product and make the deal. And if we cleaned up our regulatory burden in a concerted, three-level-of-government way, 
our small businesses would begin to grow much more vibrantly. So you endorse. That doesn't mean. I, I, I mean, I talk about the example of yeah. uh, on Greg's point of you know, the emerging fintechs in the book. I talk about mm -hmm. we have such a great financial services industry. We should really be leading the world in financial technology companies and emerging growth in that area. Mm -hmm. Most of the fintechs I talked to said they need to actually hire lawyers to figure out which of our 10 plus financial services regulators they need to actually have jurisdiction over their company. What about the so language spending, laws in the, uh, you talk about in the book as well? I talk about the language laws in the book as well where so many, we, we lost a great entrepreneur in Lauren Abney because he was forced to put French labeling on pet food he was shipping to Texas. And it was arriving in Texas, well, and people you know were saying... It's not such a burden uh, <laughs> to put French language on a product that's going to Texas. And the Texans are not going to be offended by well, they, it. Well, this is the point was they were, Greg. They were you saying, know you know what? what? The, yeah, don't tell me that the average uh, consumer in Texas said, oh, I can't buy that. There's French on it. Well, uh, there was an 8%, there's an 8% cost premium for mo on average across all consumer packaged goods yeah. because everything has to be labeled. But, you know, there's a million languages. examples yeah. like that that yeah. come out in trade agreements where yeah. we have weird labeling requirements. I remember the example <laughs> of cheesies came up of all silly things and it, it meant you couldn't export your products. So there's there's a very very long list of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, but, let, know, me, let me let me put an Catherine, example. Catherine, we are we are becoming a nation of exporters. We're actually doing We've always quite been. well. We We've always yeah. been, but we don't just want yeah. it to be natural resources. And, we and, we do yeah. want it to be that, but not just that. And the countries to which we are exporting have an equal amount of regulatory burdens that they put uh, on their indigenous businesses. It's a global process. Let's not pretend in Canada that we are uh, that we are suffering burdens that don't exist in basically every other jurisdiction. They do to varying degrees. But again, we can't control that. We can control our, our situation at home. That. So Oops, let, me get, let me get Craig in here. And Craig, I want to raise something with you that is actually quite timely right now. And I want, to, I want you to give us your sense about the impact on small business and how uh, either harmful or not you believe it to be. Ontario just upped the minimum wage a lot. Uh, in January 2019, we're going to go to $15 an hour for the minimum wage. We've seen what's happened to Tim Hortons. We've seen a lot of other people. You've got the Minister of Labour now saying that he's going to hire about almost 150 new inspectors to get out there and ensure that uh, people who are entitled to the minimum wage are actually getting it. In your view, how impactful is that policy on small businesses' ability to grow? Well, I think it's going to be a, a big shock to businesses because of the speed at which the minimum wage is going up. I, I think we could have gone to $15 an hour over a, a longer time frame and had more of a chance for businesses to adjust to the to the, the higher uh, labor compensation. Um, but our modeling, the that you know, we, we we produce detailed economic forecasts for Ontario, and our models would say that the Ontario economy is probably going to lose about. Uh, 42,000 jobs out of the increase in the minimum wage as businesses uh, reduce the amount of labor that they're willing to hire. Now, that doesn't mean employment's actually going to fall. Like it's it's 42,000 jobs that would have otherwise been created. It, you know, your businesses will likely adjust their business model gradually over time, and as people leave leave the company, retire, etc., they'll adjust their pay scales. So, I, I you know, employment in Ontario is going to rise, but it's going to be significantly slower in terms of a growth rate. Uh, as businesses adjust to the the rapid increase in 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 the minimum wage, um, it will it will have an offset in the sense that um, you know those workers that get the, the higher wages will will largely spend it. They won't save it, and this will have a an impact on 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 spending in the economy. And certainly, it will improve you know the sense of a, of, of providing a livable wage. But I think it is going to be a big adjustment because typically, when when you increase minimum wages of sort of this sort of magnitude. You would you would do it over a longer time frame. Just one one data point on the last discussion about regulation. Um, Ontario has twice as many regulations as BC, and I tend to think of BC as a well-regulated market. So, but we've you know, got, I, I we've do got think three... there's scope to cut regulation. Okay, but we've got three times their population. Does that matter? <laughs> that <laughs> doesn't necessarily. No, is there, there's no relationship there. No. Okay, right. hang up. Before I want to get back to the minimum wage thing here, and Catherine, I know you want to weigh in on this, but <laughs> I want to be a little mischievous first. I want to ask the former Liberal finance minister what he thinks of the current Liberal finance minister's move to put in a 32% increase in the minimum wage in one fell swoop and then go to $15 in January 2019? I think it's going to have a very negative effect on the economy. Uh, I mean, quietly, businesses are going to adjust by moving to technology, uh, letting, laying people off, uh, curtailing hours. Uh, and uh, in many parts of rural Ontario, businesses will just close because they can't absorb it. I mean, you've got, you know, you have a million... 
you have a profit and loss statement where salaries and benefits is a million dollars. Uh, if in one a year and a half that goes up to one point four million dollars, yeah. that extra revenue doesn't just mm -hmm. sort of magically appear. Uh, I put in a minimum wage increase in my two thousand and seven budget, and it was measured. The other thing that I have a problem with is that a very large number of people who work at a minimum wage are so-called casual participants in the workforce. They are students, they are retirees, they are people that are adding to their income. If you want to deal with poverty, deal with poverty. Do it through a guaranteed annual income, do it through, with income supplements. Don't put dealing with poverty on the backs of businesses. Actually, that's the same point Andrew Coyne made in one of his columns on the weekend. And the I National sent him a note saying yeah. it was a brilliant yeah. And column. you appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, your view on the minimum wage? Well, I, I, it has, actually is just related to it, and, and, and I think it's related to our bigger topic here, which is that both with the federal government's so-called small business tax reform last year uh, and continuing it, it'll be a fiasco, I guarantee, because the red tape involved in it is outrageous, so it's not fixed by any stretch. But anyway... And, and the local, the re recent minimum wage stuff in Ontario, the tone of the politicians to me was huge. It demon, they, they're demonizing business as the bad guys. They're saying, you're, you're kind of tax cheats. You're, you're stiffing your employees. You're, you know, you're, you're rotten people, basically. Well, and this all plays that, into... Except that a couple of franchisee owners in Tim Hortons in Coburg did stiff their employees. Well, it, it, but you know what's interesting? If they had just been, been quiet, and I'm not, again, I'm not saying this should have happened, but if they had been quiet, just let a couple of people go, not touch the benefits and not touch, touch publicly about mm -hmm. it, then they were definitely making a public statement. There's yes. no doubt they yes. were. Right. Yes. And, and in a way, that was brave of them, you know, mm -hmm. because, again, so if you've got a country where your, your politicians, federally in Ontario and elsewhere, are demonizing business and you're thinking of starting one up, you're thinking, do I need this grief? Do I need to be all over the papers and the headlines? That discourages businesses as well. well and that, to me, is a huge issue This in is a huge issue, Catherine, I agree. And we're in the knowledge economy now. And in the knowledge economy, jobs are global. They're fully portable. And we're in, in a situation where in the U.S., the administration is moving to lower taxes, simplified regulations. It's increasingly attractive. For those entrepreneurs that we really need to stay here, the ones that have the unlimited addressable market and global expansion opportunities, we really need them to stay. And we're becoming much less attractive, and the United States is becoming that much more attractive. Indeed. And, and to me, again, demonizing business, saying they're the bad guys, and this somehow helps our competitiveness, come on, it's contrary to it. And frankly, shame on the politicians. They, they should know better. Yeah, there's issues, little blips that come up. We know Wynn's using it totally for politics in the election this year and so on. But shame on them. It's divisive, cheap politics, and it shouldn't happen. Want to go back to Ottawa and have our friend Craig Alexander talk to us about another one of these issues that's come up recently, and that is income sprinkling. This is something that small businesses have relied on uh, for years and years and years. Uh, I guess the main owner of the business tends to take some of their taxable income and put it on, let's say, the spouse's income and as a result it puts everybody in a lower tax bracket and it is a way i guess for small business people who don't have you know public pension plans or that kind of thing uh, to save a little money and be able to uh, make their money go a little further uh, again in your view the federal government is certainly trying to tighten up on that right now uh, how deleterious is that to small businesses to try to cut back on income sprinkling craig in your view well the the government's numbers suggest that the bulk of the 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 tax benefits accrue to about 3% of the private corporations in, in Canada. So, you know, I, I think that the government tightening up the, the rules on income sprinkling is not going to be, you know, uh, hugely detrimental, but they also needed to be a bit more mindful about how they went about it. So, for example, um, you know, when it comes to policy, when you change policy, you always have to worry about the possible unintended consequences. So, you know, when they when they proposed their their tax changes, they were going to make it actually, you know, unattractive for family farms to 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 sell to the next generation. It was more attractive to actually sell in the marketplace. You know, clearly that wasn't the intent of the policy, um, but it it was, you know, as as the policy was originally designed, that's what was going to happen. Um, now they've changed the rules to saying that they'll allow income sprinkling, um, but with, with some limitations in terms of, you know, demonstrating the family members are actually contributing to, to the business. And maybe that makes some, you know, maybe that makes more, more economic sense than, the, than the, the blanket way they were an initially targeting it. But it is true that small businesses don't have the same vehicles 
to, to save. So for things like retirement, which is, you know, the, the example you gave is the ideal example of why some income sprinkling makes sense. Okay, Greg Sabera, let me get you to follow up. Everybody obviously wants to pay as little tax as they have to. Yep, yep. And income sprinkling has been done by small business owners over the years in order to legally avoid paying as much tax as possible. Do you think it's legitimate? Well, uh, what is not legitimate is that uh, we have a taxation system in Canada uh, that is a 1960s model trying to deal with an economy that is a 21st century economy. And part of the result is that more and more money flows into the hands of fewer and fewer people. Uh, and uh, income equality uh, continues to worsen right across uh, uh, all Western economies, and it's serious in Canada as well. So if a small business uh, says, we're going to use an element of that uh, archaic tax system to earn a little more for ourselves, I can understand that. One day, uh, we will put in place a commission that re-examines thoroughly our taxation system and builds a system that is appropriate for the economy that we have today, not the economy that we had in the 1960s. I haven't done that in 55 years. Well, the Whatever. Carter Commission and was the last. don't hold your breath. Well, you know what? I, I, I'm <laughs> not urgent. holding my breath. It's urgent. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree. It's urgent. But I'm just saying, yeah. it's so politicized. Yeah. Yeah. Every yeah. single yeah. group that's getting a break, and there's lots yeah. of them. We're talking about small business today. Yeah. Look at labor unions. Mm -hmm. Look at income. Tr look at trusts. Look at uh, stock yeah. ops. Anyway, on and on and on. You know, there's so many constituencies that are getting some some really but good benefits that they'll all be lobbying like crazy. I think I'd love to. But Catherine, yeah. the fact is that a, a well-designed new system will have transitional mechanisms to get us from where we are to where we need to be. But if we just stay with where we need no, to I'm be, not saying we, we will see more and more money flowing into the hands of fewer and fewer people and small businesses feeling the pressure of regulation and the inability to earn a good living, not uh, not an acceptable, but a good living, uh, that's what makes them give up. When but they also, can't when you've got half living. of your half of your in, more than half of your income getting taxed away in six provinces, which is the case right now, Absolutely. if you, if you bother to succeed, then uh, tell me how that's a winner for anybody. You it know, really it, 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 that's when point. that's when the tax system is out of control when it hits that fifty percent mark, and we're doing it in Canada in the majority of the country. But back to the original question: Do you think tax? Do you think income sprinkling? Uh, putting some of your income on your spouses, for example, or on one of your kids or something in order to lessen your taxable income. Is that a legitimate vehicle for small businesses to try to reduce their taxable income? If that in your person's view? contributing to the business, yes. And that, that is what the if big not? kicker. What if they're not? Well, then probably not, frankly. Mm -hmm. and, and there used to be rules in place. That there used to be more blanket rules, as Greg referred to it, where mm -hmm. at a, if, if, a, if a child, for example, was below a certain age, they weren't eligible for it because mm -hmm. it was right. not sensible that they were really contributing. Mm -hmm. I think the, the problem with the fix they've done, the so-called fix, because I predict it's going to be a fiasco, uh, is the red <laughs> tape. The <laughs> red <laughs> tape. Yeah. The red Red tape. It's too much they, of a subjective it is test. unbelievable. Yeah, the subject, subjective. They're calling it yeah. a reasonableness test. Yeah. And who as soon decides as you use that what's word, reasonable? Who is going to decide? Just, yeah. Well, yeah, CRA well. will. CRA. And yeah. we'll get more costly yeah. bureaucrats right. to administer this. You're going to get a lot of tax challenges in the courts. Yeah. They're mm -hmm. going to be looking at it again a, in a year and going, we got to fix this mess. It's a cost explosion. Oh, it's just a to disaster. To this, disaster I think it's a disaster. cost to the federal government? To everyone. To everyone. But we need to fix the tax. The entire system. All participants in the system. We need to fix the system. Let's Agreed. not underestimate how hard it's going to be. <laughs> Income sprinkling? You in favor of that? I'm with Catherine and with Greg. I think that it's acceptable as long as it's being done in a legitimate way and there's real contribution to the business. I think it's a legitimate way to manage taxes. And I do agree with the small business community saying, look, we don't have pensions. We don't have security, any job guarantees. security. We don't have any guarantees. We have a bad year. We lose money. Tough we might lose and, our house, and yeah. that'll affect the whole family. Yeah. And that kind of thing so, justifies the notion so that the whole family two, has some risk involved. I agree. I, those two offset to me, and I think it's appropriate, as long as it's done in a legitimate way. Craig Alexander, getting you back in here again to start off the next area of discussion, uh, and that will be picking winners and losers. I want to, I know we touched on this earlier, but I want to go a little more in-depth right now on the notion of whether governments, as Anthony has suggested in his book, need to get behind various businesses or various sectors in a way which actually puts them in the position of picking winners and losers either in that sector or picking winners and losers of sectors to begin with. What's the, what does the data tell us on, on the advisability of doing that? 
Well, the, the, the governments have a very long history of being very bad at picking winners and losers. And so this is where you end up with very costly and very ineffective public policy. Um, but at the same time, I do think that there's a way that we can champion businesses to grow and use public policy to, to help achieve it. So if, if instead of championing just small business as a category, we've put more emphasis on growing businesses. And so, you know, if we look at um, high, high growth businesses that often get, gets called, get called gazelles, you know, these are companies that over three years grow at, you know, 20% a year. Well, if you, if the market, if the market, the private sector is demonstrating that that company is a winner, you know, then government could basically say, okay, so how do we actually remove barriers to the continued growth of that, of that firm? So if you look at the World Economic uh, Forum data, it shows that Canada is, is the second best place in the world to start a business. You know, it only takes two processes, it takes 15 days, and you can, you can have a business up and going in Canada, which is astounding when you compare to, you know, compare to other, other, other places like in Europe. But when you look at the ability to scale a business, that's where Canada falls down. So we, we're great at launching businesses, but we're, we're not very good at, at scaling businesses. And so the question is, how, how, do, how do you achieve this? And the traditional government approach has been, has been to pick sectors. But high growth firms are found in every sector, every industry, uh, various sizes. And so I, I do think that policy can be used, but it has to be used in a more effective way. All right, let's go to Greg Sabera next. Uh, when you were in government, when you were minister, I'm not sure actually you were minister of finance at the moment it happened, but you, in the lead up to it were, uh, the government of Ontario and the United States and Canada all decided in their wisdom to put billions into saving the auto industry. Right. That is yeah. clearly picking winners and losers, and you guys decided to bet on big auto. In hindsight? Uh, I think it was uh, an inevitable decision. The auto sector in North America was too important, and we were trying to save an economy, and you just couldn't uh, accept a result where tens of thousands of auto workers were uh, no longer uh, uh, with work. So that's okay to pick winners so and losers I, in that I think, you know, I think picking sectors is okay. Uh, in my first year as finance minister, we picked the... Uh, media sector, arts and entertainment, and filmmaking. Uh, and the decision that we made resulted in an industry that has grown every year well beyond uh, the average economic growth and is part of the, uh, the economy of the city of Toronto and the province of Ontario. Because of the subsidies and tax breaks you gave to producers. That's exactly right. And if, and, 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 and if you look mm -hmm. at... Uh, uh, you all balked when I mentioned Bombardier. Most <laughs> large uh, uh, countries, like Canada... Uh, support an aerospace sector, uh, whether it's uh, Boeing or uh, Airbus, uh, Airbus or whatever. And we have to be in that business. Do we? Uh, uh, we can well, buy their stuff. You know what? I, I, do we? I think we do. We don't have a competitive uh, advantage, Jenna. Uh, uh, well, you know what? Every time you fly out of uh, uh, the island airport, you're on a Bombardier. Yeah, but that doesn't mean I wouldn't be on something else. I, 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 that's I, that's okay. it, so it's I'm cost saying benefit. I it's don't mind benefit, picking right? uh, the aerospace sector and saying we want to be a player. Not, the large, not a very large, large player, but a player, and I'm okay with it. Anthony, tell me what you mean then when you say you want governments to be in there picking winners and losers well, in well, some Well, that's respects. an important clarification here, okay. Steve. I'm not proposing that government picks winners. What I'm saying is government's going to do along the lines of what Craig was talking about, where we enable that business that has a proven gazelle, that is a proven high-growth firm, we enable it to grow faster and scale in Canada. Oh, what I'm saying in terms of doubling down on winners is that once the private sector once a certain amount of private capital, venture capital, has gone into a business, into a high growth firm, and it's clearly on its way to becoming a gazelle, that's when government would be making that double down effort. To do what? So government's not making the choice. The private sector, with the related expertise, is making the choice. Okay, I understand the I, distinction. I propose but what do you a number of things. So for yeah. starters, I'm saying if, a, if a, whatever amount of private capital has gone in, uh, three million, four million, five million dollars into a high growth startup, government matches that amount with a non dilutive loan. And the only term on the loan is, if you leave, move your headquarters out of Canada, the loan is immediately repayable. Hmm. And we help that business scale faster. An existing, proven startup that's already a high-growth firm, we just help accelerate its growth and help it export globally. That's okay. too low a threshold. <laughs> there will be a lot of applications for well, that. I don't know that there will be that great... That's a, that's a segment, much. though. A certain number of VCs, a certain... No, I don't think it can be in any industry. No, no, I don't that's think not, we should that's pick not what yeah. I meant. Yeah. Um, I meant that 
you know, the, the challenge also, that, that's one challenge for sure, because we're bad at medium-sized firms. We, are, we, we do right. start them up, yep, yeah. and medium-sized. We, lose we often sell them to the states well, or we something. Lose, that you know? is what happens. Yeah. I mean, I talk yeah. about that. We truncate so many yeah. outcomes. So yeah. I profile Samir Dar in this book. Had a great exit by Canadian standards. He sold his business for, you know, eight figures. Could have been a multi-hundred million or billion dollar firm. But his aspiration size, his event, not his investor aspiration size, and his own aspiration size was con constrained by the mentality that we have here in Canada. Hmm. The point I was just going to add is that there's also the challenge of the firm that hasn't produced, hasn't proved itself yet, but will be a gazelle or whatever mm. the heck you want to call yeah. it. And and that is <laughs> yeah. that is real sorcery to try to figure out <laughs> right. when somebody's yeah. a six month old business. Typically, Agreed. a business loses money for the first few years. Agreed. I don't. I'm Ian, not suggesting that, that, is, speculate. that is real it's sorcery. It's not speculation. I'm saying let's let's in, back the winners. In our last 20 seconds here, I am reminded of the joke they used to tell when I was a kid all the time, which is, how do you start a small business in Canada? Mm -hmm. You start a big one and you wait. Wait a while. Right. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> is, is it that bad still? No, it's not. It's not that bad. It's okay. not that bad. Yeah. But again. I, I mean, really, I think we're agreeing on more yeah, than we're disagreeing. It, it, the, the notion that we have culture issues, we have the great sucking sound south of the border that is going to change its tax system. Something we haven't mm. mentioned, or at least mm. we haven't mentioned much, is technology. The mm. robots are coming. Mm. We are going to have so many industries changed yeah. radically These are all in the future next programs. few years. <laughs> These are all future programs. <laughs> And with that, can I thank Including everybody for appearing? For <laughs> <programs> <laughs> and like I know this. it's coming. I know it's coming. You're Indeed. In trouble, Steve. Can I thank Craig Alexander for being there for us in the nation's capital, the senior VP, chief economist for the Conference Board of Canada. Thanks so much, Craig. Back here in our studio in the big smoke, there's Greg Sorbera, the former finance minister for the province of Ontario. Catherine Swift, formerly of the CFIB, now with Working Canadians. And Anthony Lacavera, I love pronouncing your last name. <laughs> How we can win and what happens to us and our country if we don't. Thanks so much, everybody. Steve, Good to have you on TVO here. tonight. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.